It should not come as a surprise by now that Metroid is one of my favorite game series of all time. The act of exploring a massive world for upgrades and figuring out where you can use them is endlessly satisfying. The Prime games are some of my favorite games for this very reason. Metroid Prime took the formula of 2D Metroid and beautifully adapted it into a 3D plane, with plenty of new ideas also thrown in to create an experience unlike anything else, for all of the right reasons. Metroid Prime 2, Echoes, built on the foundation laid out by the first game by both mending its flaws and leaning into a more puzzly design philosophy. What did Metroid Prime 3 do? Well, I'm not entirely sure. To tell you the truth, I've never beaten this game. I've tried multiple times, but for some reason I never saw it through to the very end. Metroid Prime 3, or Corruption, for the sake of brevity, never fully clicked with me, but this isn't to say there aren't aspects of the game I can't appreciate. With this video, I aim to discern what about this game put me off originally, and see if fully completing it provides me with a new perspective on the game, both on its own and in the context of the Prime Trilogy. Before we proceed, I highly encourage you to watch my videos on the first two games in the trilogy before watching this one, if you haven't already. Many of the things I neglect to mention here that apply to the other games were likely mentioned there. With that said, my name is Kohana, and this is Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Corruption was released for the Nintendo Wii on August 27, 2007. It received high review scores and overall positive reception, which is to be expected for a game in the Metroid Prime series. Despite originally being slated to release alongside the Wii's launch, the game suffered multiple delays. Retro Studios had originally planned to create massive environments with open world elements, but the technical specs of the Wii rendered the team unable to bring these ideas to fruition. The team grappled with the game's controls all throughout development, which is cited as the primary reason for the delays. The extra time they were given allowed them to create a fantastic control scheme for the game, which allowed for motion-based aiming independent of the player's movement. The Wii is and was a system all about accessibility, and that was a driving factor of this new control scheme. But the idea of the system being accessible transcended the control design and corruption. It's now a main focus of the level design. Immediately upon starting the game, it's apparent just how different Corruption is from its predecessors. We begin in Samus' gunship, in the view of the cockpit. I always like this, as this is the first and only time in the series we've been able to see inside the gunship, let alone control it. In prior titles, the gunship was essentially a glorified save point that you would pass occasionally, so to have it be a mechanic of the game is a fantastic bit of fan service. Also, Controlling the gunship just makes me feel really awesome. Once you confirm your identity, you're cleared to land on the Federation's battleship. The first time I played this game, I was thrown off by this opening, because typically Metroid games just get right to the point and drop you in where you're supposed to be. Corruption, however, sees you exploring the Federation's ship and reporting to the Admiral to get your mission assigned to you. I originally wasn't a fan of this because I loved how the past games made you feel like you were exploring on your own and uncovering the secrets of the world yourself, but now I can appreciate the opening for what it does in the greater context of both the game and the series. It provides a safe environment to familiarize the player with the new control scheme while also offering a great deal of world building. The Federation is something we've never really seen before aside from Fusion, but having it fully fleshed out in a 3D plane is really cool. It's here that we're introduced to our fellow bounty hunters, Rundus, Gore, and Gandreda, as well as the Aurora unit. This area also features voice acting from every single character you encounter, which is atypical of a Metroid game. I was also originally against this because it felt antithetical to the trademark Metroid atmosphere of isolation. However, after seeing what the game is going for with its storytelling, I came to appreciate it. Not to mention, 
It's surprisingly well done for a game of this era. It manages to give each of the bounty hunters their own distinct personalities, which helps mix their fights later on in the game have a bit more weight behind them. Had they opted to give Samus fully voiced lines in this section of the game, I wouldn't be a fan, since we seldom hear her voice and it just would have felt odd, but thankfully, Retro refrained from doing so. Anyway, after receiving the briefing from Admiral Dane, Olympus is invaded by space pirates, and this is where the game acquaints you with the updated control scheme. I played this game via Prime Hack on PC to gather footage, but I also ran through the trilogy version once more on my own time. On native hardware, you'll be using the Wii Remote to aim your crosshair and perform motion-based inputs for various tasks like pumping or twisting. The game will also ask you to frequently swing the nunchuck around to use the grapple lasso on objects and enemies. Despite feeling kind of awkward to do, it worked surprisingly well. I never had any issue with it misreading my inputs. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for the pumps or keys. Movements like pulling, twisting, and pushing the keys just straight up wouldn't work sometimes, and it got pretty frustrating. Pumping is especially frustrating to mess up coming off of Prime Hack, since it's so much faster to do there. Prime Hack allowed me to use a mouse for aiming and camera control, and every motion input that I ever needed to make was bound to a single key on the keyboard. I'm a firm believer that the motion inputs required at stands like these add nothing substantive to the gameplay and are just kind of annoying. Thankfully, the entire game isn't based around those, so it's only a minor complaint. Another thing I'd like to bring up is the camera sensitivity, although this may be specific to me. I couldn't really find a setup in the options that was comfortable, so I ended up just sticking to standard, even though it felt too fast at the distance I was sitting at. Over time I adjusted, but I never fully got used to it. Just something I thought I'd mention. Regardless, this section does a great job at familiarizing the player with the controls, mechanics, and arsenal at your disposal. One of my biggest gripes with the game is immediately apparent in this section though. The game is incredibly insistent on placing key items on your path, such as energy tanks and missile upgrades throughout its entire runtime. Out of all 14 of the energy tanks in the game, 10 of them will be on or just a door away from the main path. Missile expansions are not hard to come by either. There are a few where you'll have to solve a puzzle or think outside of the box or something, but if you've played any of the prior games in the series, you'll rack up missiles like crazy. Even just the missile expansions you're likely to find on the main path are more than enough to get through the game. This is an issue because Metroid is a series that thrives on exploration and puzzle solving, and your reward for doing so is typically a way to progress, a missile expansion, or an energy tank. Energy tanks are arguably the most valuable upgrades aside from the ones that gate progression, but this is even more so the case in Corruption. I'll explain this in a bit more detail later. Once you make your escape from Olympus, you'll head to the Federation base on planet Norian. You and the other bounty hunters are tasked with getting the power generators back online to power the defense mechanisms. This area is very linear, and thus it places a focus on combat rather than exploration. There are a number of sequences where you'll be having to strafe and duck behind cover while fighting space pirates. I'm willing to give this a pass due to this area still being very early on in the game, but this isn't the only area that it's noticeable. Somewhere along the path, you'll encounter Ridley and activate a cool set piece. Both you and Ridley are plummeting down a massive pit, and you'll have to fight him in doing so. The fight is pretty easy, but it fills you with this sense of dread as you continue to fall, so in that regard I like it a lot. After activating all the generators and meeting up with the other bounty hunters once again, Dark Samus will break into the control room and knock everybody unconscious. A month later, Samus is reawakened to discover that her body is naturally generating Phazon as a result of the blast. The Federation harnessed this power into a suit upgrade that allows Samus to use the devastating power of Phazon in exchange for energy. This is known as Hyper Mode, and it's one of the central mechanics of the game. A small detail I appreciate about Corruption is that the blast that knocks you down doesn't strip you of all your upgrades like in the past two games. In fact, you only gain from it because you're given the PED suit. It's nice that nearly an hour of progression wasn't for nothing. Once you make your way to the Aurora unit, it will inform you that the other bounty hunters were sent on missions to destroy the Leviathan planets that harbor copious amounts of Phazon. Their efforts were unsuccessful, as the Federation lost contact with them weeks ago, and you are tasked with finding out what happened to them. This is where I feel the game truly begins. 
Instead of the interconnected world layout of Prime games of the past, Corruption opts to segment each of its regions on other planets entirely. The main planets you'll be visiting are Brio, Elysia, Norian, and the Pirate Homeworld. Brio is a planet of many aesthetics. One area will place you in a gel fuel extraction facility, another you'll find yourself in a tropical jungle. Elysia is home to a floating city in the sky built by the Chozo many years ago. The Pirate Homeworld is an industrial lab occupied by the Space Pirates. All of these worlds are much bigger in scope than anything out of the first two games, so it would have felt odd to have them all on the same planet. Instead of making your way to the other regions on foot like in past games, you travel to each one via the gunship. At first, I really liked doing this because it made the universe of corruption feel massive, but I quickly realized how the gunship hindered level structure and backtracking. If you recall, one of my biggest issues with Prime 1 was the layout of Magmore Caverns. This area essentially boiled down to a long, straight line of rooms that housed only two elevators to Fendrana Drifts. This meant that any time you needed to backtrack to or from Fendrana, you'd have to go through a long stretch of rooms in Magmore Caverns. This was especially troubling in the first half of the game, where you've only unlocked the first elevator. A common example that gets brought up is the trek to get the space jump boots. This upgrade required you to go from Fendrana to Magmore to Talon 4, and then back in reverse. How all of this relates to corruption is the fact that nearly every area is laid out like Magmore Caverns. This is due to the fact that you can only exit a given area by entering the gunship, and there are never more than two landing pads at any area. When you're asked to backtrack to another planet to retrieve an upgrade, it's actually quite nice to be able to go anywhere from a single location, but the game rarely asks this of you. This leaves the rest of the game enduring an aggressively linear structure that's only in service of a few moments of the total playtime. I want to be clear that I don't think linearity is a bad thing on its own, as even my favorite game in the trilogy, Echoes, has some linear sections. The issue manifests through repetitive backtracking due to constantly having to travel through the same rooms to get to the landing sites, but it also plays into the painfully easy item collecting I mentioned earlier. The linearity combined with the obvious placement of items essentially guarantees that you'll find nearly all of them. And this is completely by design. Remember how I said that energy tanks are important in corruption specifically? Like I said earlier, hyper mode is one of the core mechanics of corruption, and it's viable to different degrees based on how many energy tanks you've acquired. Well, at least in theory. Hyper mode is a mechanic that upon activation will increase your damage output in exchange for taking away your energy. However, there's also a chance that if you use it for too long, you will become corrupted and must drain all of the Phazon out of your system, or else you'll die. The intention of this mode was to create a mechanic out of a high-risk, high-reward dynamic, but it didn't really end up working in practice. Enemies drop a ton of energy when they die, practically refilling all of the depleted energy from hyper mode depending on how many there were. Combine this with the fact that energy tanks are abundant, and there are basically no downsides to using hyper mode. The damage potential in Hyper Mode is devastating, so depending on how often you want to use it, the combat sections and the game as a whole become painfully easy. Even playing on the highest difficulty doesn't rectify this issue, since enemies still drop the same amount of health. I like that Retro tried to create a unique mechanic out of the premise that Samus is corrupted by Phazon, but it just wasn't executed well due to the abundance of energy in the game. Hopefully it's clear to you now how all of these elements that I think are already issues on their own come together to create a larger issue that ultimately bogs down the quality of the game. Having said that, I'd like to focus a bit on the worlds themselves. The first planet you'll visit after beginning the main quest is Brio, and its layout mostly consists of linear hallways that all end up connecting to the separate regions of the map at the end of the game. You'll be asked to take down all of the generators that power the defense system of the Leviathan Seed, this boils down to just traveling around the planet from landing site to landing site and completing a semi-puzzle or combat challenge. Aside from finding a few basic upgrades here like the grapple beam, Brio is pretty unremarkable. It's got kind of a cool aesthetic I guess, but pales in comparison to the other two main planets. I like the vibe of the cliff area and the mining facility, but that's really all I can say. I have trouble recalling distinct rooms in Brio, as it all just kind of jumbles in my memory. The one exception makes for one of my favorite moments in the entire game though. A bit later on, you'll have to return to Brio to get the screw attack, but by now, you'll have the plasma beam. This allows you to access a hidden temple that teleports you to a snowy building. 
The atmosphere here feels like a homage to Fendrana Drifts, and the music certainly reinforces that vibe. The area is so serene, it almost feels like home. The fact that there aren't even any enemies here makes the area feel almost comforting. Unfortunately, you're only there for a little bit and you never return again. Although, it's a nice little reminder of where we began while you're there. The next planet you visit chronologically is Elysia. This planet houses a city in the sky built by the Chozo decades ago. Your first time landing here is ethereal. The smooth mixture of yellows and grays combined with the gorgeous music certainly make it an experience. Skytown Elysia is a beautiful area, perhaps one of the best looking in all of the Metroid series but it suffers from some serious design flaws that make its first act one of the most tedious sections of any Metroid game. The area features rails that you glide on from building to building, and you'll have to shoot at some targets while riding along to pass the time. These rails can sometimes take a pretty significant amount of time to get off of, and it gets repetitive. Anytime you want to go to another building, you'll have to take them. The buildings are designed mostly vertically, where you'll commonly have to move up and down throughout each one to get to the other side. This allowed the developers to make use of a rather limited space on a platform, but it also extends the length of time spent traveling through them. This main island is the one exception. It allows you to just simply move between the three connecting rails. Now take a look at how long it takes to get to the other side of this building. The point is, navigating or backtracking through this area gets extremely tedious rather quickly. The most grueling example of annoying backtracking is getting the plasma beam. After curing the Aurora unit, you'll have to go back to your ship to fight Gore. This is on the complete opposite side of the map from your current location. After beating Gore, you'll have to go all the way back to the AU to repair the fuses. At least on your way back, there's a cannon you can unlock that cuts down a chunk of the travel time but I still maintain that traveling from island to island in this area is extremely unfun, especially after doing so for this long. Skytown Elysio is one of the main culprits of killing my enjoyment of this game on my first few playthroughs. This is typically where I would drop the game as a matter of fact. What that means though is that I totally missed the best part of Skytown, the second half. This area of Skytown sees you assembling a bomb that the Federation needs to drop on the Leviathan Seed. Generally, these rooms are much more seamlessly attached than that of the first area. This means you'll rarely be traversing via the rails. Your task in this area is to build a bomb, so you'll have to fly the gunship around in order to find parts. Aside from this, there's also a cool area where you'll be navigating through a creepy science lab containing metroids to find the seeker missiles. I love the atmosphere of this area in particular. It feels really tense. I think that having a more focused objective in this region of Skytown also makes all the wandering around you're doing feel less pointless. Having to go back and forth from every single building in the first region felt tedious because you were given so many different tasks, but the second half is much more contained. Once you've constructed the bomb, you have to fly the center spire structure over the Leviathan, but the space pirates will do everything in their power to stop you from doing so. This initiates a fun combat sequence where waves of space pirates and ships will attack you in the structure, and you have to kill them before they are able to succeed. This is a good segue into something else I wanted to talk about, which is the enemy variety present in this game. We've seen the space pirates plenty before, but their new design is one of my personal favorites. I love how they're all also infused with Phazon, which makes them feel more menacing. Brio contains these weird alien things that kind of resemble dogs which I think are also pretty cool. Alicia has a bunch of robotic enemies, etc. Sure, not all of them are winners, 
the robot orbs that just kind of lower their shields one by one and let you shoot at them are pretty lame, but at least the developers didn't recycle the same enemies for most of the game like in Prime 1. I also think it's cool to fight the entire space pirate ship, because it feels like a big accomplishment in the context of the story once you take it down. Anyway, after destroying the second Leviathan, it's time to invade the pirate homeworld. This is my personal favorite planet in the game due to both its atmosphere and map layout. Traversing this area feels like you're sneaking around the unsuspecting pirates, trying your best not to be seen. This is especially the case due to the sheer amount of morph ball tunnels. As I said in my video on Echoes, I think that the morph ball sections when done right can be some of the best moments in a prime game. It doesn't quite reach the same heights as Echoes does, but using it frequently here under tense circumstances is fun in its own right. I also really appreciate the dark, gloomy, industrial vibes on display here. It makes each room and background visually stimulating, and it helps the planet feel like a real lair. Your objective on this planet is to access a cargo route that connects to the final Leviathan Seed, but to get there, you'll have to get through the Acid Rain. It's not as straightforward to find upgrades here as it is on the other planets, as the map design is the most non-linear of the game. There are even trains that will transport you around the region to other areas. It makes traveling around easy and fun. Towards the end of your time on the Pirate Homeworld, there's a mission that requires you to escort some Federation troopers towards the door to the Seed. The mission succeeds in what it wants to accomplish by creating tense combat sequences that place a healthy amount of stress on the player. Even the sound that plays upon a soldier's death makes you feel like an utter failure. No. However, I have to call into question some of the implications here. One of the troopers mentions that they have weak armor, and that's evident in the combat sections because they die extremely quickly. My question would be, why? Scan logs mention that they aren't well trained in battle, so that seems like all the more reason to armor them up even more thoroughly. You'd think that the Federation would send out some more combat troopers to assist Samus in protecting them if that wasn't possible, but instead, they put the weight of 12 people's lives on the shoulders of Samus. The Federation sure does sound pretty sketchy to me, but perhaps I'm just reading too much into it. Anywho, I find the mission to be a nice change of pace for the brief moment you're doing it. Although I'm not fond of what the gunship adds gameplay-wise, I appreciate that it adds context to having all of these different aesthetics present in the game. This is made possible because of the fact that all of these regions are on different planets instead of being on just one like past games. Many people criticized Prime 1 because there were all of these different regions in close proximity to seemingly contradictory ones. Namely, the fact that Magmor Caverns and Fendrana Drifts are just an elevator ride away. This was never an issue I had with the game personally, but I'm glad they took an approach that was able to satisfy everybody with its explanation. The final notable area of the game is the GFS Valhalla ship. The Valhalla is a Federation ship that was hijacked by the space pirates and thus nearly destroyed. This area is where you'll be depositing your endgame MacGuffins from the routine hunt. These come in the form of energy cells. Energy cells are found throughout the world powering random machines that need to be shut down, or they can be hiding somewhere on the ground. You can bring these energy cells to the Valhalla in order to unlock more upgrades and supplemental lore. This setup is great because it motivates you to find more energy cells aside from just needing them to finish the game. In fact, you only need 5 out of the total 9 to complete the game, and 3 of them are given to you on your main path. This is a huge step up from the Chozo Artifacts and Sky Temple Keys, as you needed all of them to finish the game, and no bonus upgrades were given to you. Granted, the upgrades that you get in Corruption are just extra energy tanks and missile expansions, but it's better than nothing. I also appreciate that you can progress at least marginally even by depositing one energy cell, unlike the past MacGuffins. You wouldn't make any progress in those games until you had acquired all of them. In Corruption, you can dump an energy cell and walk through a few rooms until you're barred by another empty energy slot. The energy cells are easily my favorite of the three endgame items in the Prime series because of the fact that there are only a handful that are required in the main story, and the rest being optional allows the game to reward the player with extra goodies. Overall, Corruption's Batch of Worlds are my least favorite in the Prime trilogy. I enjoy the Pirate Homeworld, but it's outclassed by every area in Echoes and the majority of areas in Prime. Brio and Alicia are beautiful in their own right, but their respective design philosophies prevent them from reaching the same heights as areas like Fendrana Drifts or Sanctuary Fortress. It's disappointing, 
because the series transitioning to new, more powerful hardware could have been an opportunity to expand the scope and intricacies of these worlds tenfold. The Wii's focus on cultivating a more casual audience undoubtedly influenced the design of this game, but when focusing on world design, I think the game suffered as a result. The Wii's motion controls and shift in design philosophy may have come as a detriment to aspects of corruption, but it also allowed for new, unique ideas to be implemented. Many of the iconic Metroid items we've come to know and love have entirely new use cases, one of which is the new grapple lasso. With the flick of the Wii nunchuck, this item allows you to rip shields out of space pirates' hands, access weak points of certain enemies, and move debris. I do like how it can shake up combat, especially while fighting hordes of space pirates. You'll have to stop shooting, pull off a shield or armor piece, and resume shooting. My main issue with this item is that it can feel kind of gimmicky at times due to how frequently the game has you use it. It can get especially annoying when you'll be pulling multiple pieces of debris back to back. Had they used this item a bit more sparingly and made it more of a combat item, I would say it's a great addition. As it stands though, it's cool but also kind of annoying. A new Metroid Prime game naturally brings with it all new beam upgrades, and corruptions are a bit of a mixed bag. There are only two beam upgrades this time around excluding the Hyper Beam, the Plasma Beam and the Nova Beam. The Plasma Beam is essentially an upgraded power beam that can melt enemies, and the Nova Beam can travel through walls and such. These beams have cool use cases outside of combat. For example, the Plasma Beam can be used as a welding device to repair broken wiring and circuit boards. Some people find this kind of lame, but personally, I find it satisfying to fill in the line with the beam. The Nova Beam can also be combined with the X-Ray Visor to find buttons through walls to shoot and activate. These ideas are all great, and they make further use of the new controls, but I can't say it's entirely perfect. See, in Corruption, the beam upgrades you get stack on each other, meaning that once you get the Plasma Beam, for example, you no longer have access to the Power Beam. This means there is really not any beam strategy at play in combat like in prior games. In Prime 1, you could choose between having the Ice Beam to freeze your enemies but do less damage, or the Plasma Beam to pack an extra punch. Echoes allowed you to choose between the weaker Power Beam or the beefier darker Light Beams at the cost of ammo. You could argue Hyper Mode is that equivalent, but then I'd just say it's easily the lamest batch of choices of the three games. The Hyper Beam doesn't really have a unique attribute besides doing more damage, and that's just kind of boring. You still do have access to the freeze ability in some capacity due to it being a missile upgrade now, but I found the variety of beams you could use in Prime 1 to be more engaging. Another aspect of the item upgrades I found to be lackluster are the gunship upgrades. These are all important upgrades to the story, and you get a handful of them throughout the game. My main issue is that these upgrades feel extremely underwhelming. I never feel the sense that I'm getting stronger after finding one. It definitely has to do with the fact that you rarely use the gunship's upgrades aside from the main story sections, but these also all feel like things the gunship should already be capable of. It doesn't help that the upgrades themselves aren't all that interesting. Upgraded missiles and a grapple beam? Please. I wish they would have thought of something a bit more interesting to implement given that this is the first Metroid game that lets us use the gunship at all. The sensation that you're getting stronger and stronger throughout a Metroid game is so gratifying, but that feeling never really hits upon acquiring a gunship upgrade. Overall, the new upgrades introduced in Prime 3 underdeliver. They range from good ideas held back by a few issues to being straight up boring. It's a shame that we couldn't have gotten some more unique items, but a lot of the series staple items carried over, so I won't complain too much. Given the unique new control scheme, I don't think I was out of line to expect a bit more though. Now that we've discussed most of the major elements of this game, I can delve into a bit more detail about the game's narrative progression. Once you're a good way into exploring Brio, you'll find Rundus, the ice bounty hunter that saved you on Norian. At first, it appears he's here to save you, but you quickly learn that is not the case. You see Dark Samus' face quickly fade in and out of view on Rundus' body and piece together what's going on. You have to kill Rundus. Rundus commonly glides around the arena on a trail of ice, which makes it so you must time your projectile bullets accordingly to hit him. I find this to be a fun little challenge throughout the fight, and it makes it all the more rewarding to actually deal damage to him. Of course, you could just use hyper mode, but that's no fun. 
Rundus will also try to freeze you with ice blocks, so you've got to dodge around those. The music creates an intense yet also somewhat triumphant atmosphere that makes the battle feel like it's between two titans. You'll rip off parts of his armor with the grapple lasso to make him more vulnerable, until the fight ends. Rundus is overcome with Phazon, and Dark Samus uses his own ice power to finish him off for good. The next bounty hunter you'll fight is Gore on Elysia. You'll get a notification that there is damage being done to your gunship, and returning to it will initiate the battle. You'll be dodging his dashes, shockwaves, and spin attacks while trying to attack vulnerable spots on his back and under his legs. From a gameplay perspective, I find this fight to be unremarkable, but far from bad. Seeing Gore's suit get blown up at the end and his body getting sucked up by Dark Samus serves as the motivation you need to press onward. Finally, on the pirate homeworld, you'll get a message from a federation trooper who claims to have managed to escape pirate captivity, and wants to help Samus in finding the Leviathan Seed. Once you find the trooper and go up the elevator, the trooper takes a shot at Samus. It turns out to have been Gandreda all along. Gandreda switches between appearing as herself, Rundus, Gore, and even Samus herself. All the while, we get the pleasure of listening to this amazing music. This theme manages to capture the essence of Metroid Prime music and adapt it into an exciting boss theme, and I love it for that. I think it's really clever how the team was able to reuse assets for this fight and still have it be a great boss. Fights like Gore that I found to be on the boring side are suddenly exciting now that I never know what's going to come next. The Gandreda fight is one of my favorites in the series for this very reason. Once you kill Gandreda, she cycles through all of her transformations until she becomes Samus reaching out for help and screaming in pain. You're forced to watch as Dark Samus consumes a duplicate of your corpse. These fights are often criticized because the game doesn't let you build enough of a relationship between the other hunters for the fights to have true emotional depth. I do agree with this sentiment, but I also think that the game agrees. The game is fully aware that the player doesn't have much of a reason to care about the hunters, but they make sure to showcase that Samus does through the cutscenes. After you beat Gore, for example, she just shoots at Dark Samus helplessly, as if to suggest she can't think of a way to stop it due to her emotions. She looks defeated as Dark Samus flies away, but she also wants to avenge her friends. Another example is the alternate ending of the game, where Samus returns to Skytown to mourn her fallen bounty hunter friends. It's hard not to feel for her in these moments, and I think that the cutscenes do a good job of showing how these deaths affect her, despite having no voice lines. The bounty hunter bosses are the most impactful in the game due to their emotional weight and direct ties with the game's story, but there are also bosses fought inside of each of the three leviathan seeds. The seed on Brio contains the Mogonar fight. Mogonar is a giant war golem that has been corrupted by Phazon, and you must damage it by hitting its red orb weak points it occasionally exposes. The song that plays during the fight doesn't really stick out of my memory as being a standout moment in the soundtrack, but when I'm experiencing it firsthand, I love it. The blaring horns reinforce the idea of Mogonar being a massive imposing threat. He's pretty easy to kill, especially if you opt to use hyper mode, but I have fun fighting him regardless. Helios is the boss fought in the Elysia Leviathan Seed. He's essentially a giant robot that uses a bunch of tiny robots swarming around him as a shield, and to damage him, you need to find an opening. Helios takes many different forms throughout the fight, 
where it uses the swarm bots to do things like grow limbs, shoot beams, etc. Some of these are cool, but I find the fight to be forgettable. Not a bad boss outright, just kind of underwhelming. Omega Ridley is the final boss of the Leviathan Seeds, and this fight is one of my favorites of the whole series. It was nice to have him return after his absence in Echoes, and the fight has plenty of creative ideas throughout. You'll first have to shoot him in the mouth to stun him, and then rip off his armor with the grapple lasso. Then, shoot at his core with your weapon of choice. I find it really satisfying to rip his armor and just lay into him with the hyperbeamer missiles. You'll later need to switch to the X-ray visor to hit the weak points of his armor, which is a nice utilization of the X-ray and Nova Beam combo. Ridley will fly through various holes in the Leviathan and come out of another to dive bomb you. It's fun to frantically search for where he'll come out next, and he spends much less time in the air than he did in Prime 1. The battle is a satisfying conclusion to both the Leviathan battles and your rivalry with Ridley throughout the Prime games. Overall, the bosses fought throughout the game vary in quality, but the high points certainly make them worthwhile. I'm generally more fond of bounty hunter boss fights, but that has little to do with the battles themselves outside of Gandreda. If I have to stomach a few mediocre bosses to get to Rundus, Gandreda, and Ridley, so be it. After eliminating all of the Leviathans, your final task is to travel to planet Phase. As the name suggests, this is a planet made out of pure Phazon. There are even sentient life forms that manifest from the substance. This section places you permanently in hyper mode, and you must make sure that you don't become corrupted by spending too long inside. The amount of time it takes for you to become corrupted is entirely dependent on how many energy tanks you got throughout the game, which is a great incentive to hunt around. Once you make your way to the core of the planet, you'll find what's at the center of it all. Dark Samus. This fight against Dark Samus is phenomenal. The music's fast pace conveys the intensity, and it really feels like Dark Samus is throwing everything it's got at you. As the fight progresses, it'll split off into duplicates until there are three of them flying around. The clones are rarely ever in sync, so it makes the fight feel that much more chaotic. Dark Samus is also incredibly agile, so it makes tracking it feel frantic. Defeating Dark Samus initiates the Aurora Unit 313 fight, which is an AU that was stolen from the Federation by the Space Pirates. It was taken to planet Phase and thus corrupted by Phazon to be at the mercy of Dark Samus's orders. The fight basically boils down to shooting the tentacles that pop out of the AU's head, ripping off its armor, and shooting the weak point. It's honestly a pretty lame final boss gameplay wise, especially since the fight is over rather quickly. The AU being corrupted is something that's alluded to on Valhalla, and it's cool to see the manifestation of that at the end of the game but that's really the only positive thing I can say about it. Even the second phase doesn't shake up the battle enough to make it interesting. Regardless, defeating the AU will kill Dark Samus, as the two are symbiotically related, and initiate the collapse of the planet. Thus, the threat of phase onto the galaxy is concluded. At the end of it all, you get perhaps one of my favorite moments of any Metroid game. Samus gives the Admiral a thumbs up, and leaves them with a simple message. Mission complete. The ending ties up the events of the trilogy nicely, while also leaving room for interpretation. Seeing the progression of the threat that Phazon posed to the galaxy throughout the games helped make each game feel more important to the timeline, despite the first two being mostly self-contained. It felt good to finally have some closure on this chapter of the story of Metroid. Although I was disappointed by corruption in many ways, it has certainly earned its place alongside the other great titles in the series. It's a game plagued by pitifully easy item collecting, confused level design, and lackluster upgrades. However, it also maintains the series pedigree of having phenomenal music, it establishes a strong atmosphere, 
and it maintains many of the core mechanics of the past games while introducing plenty of great new ideas. Not to mention, it achieves its goal of being a great place to start for Metroid newcomers, despite it being a game to conclude the trilogy. Finally completing this game did ultimately give me a new perspective on the issues I took with it originally. I learned to enjoy the game for what it is rather than what it isn't, and even the things that put me off at first like the story sections ended up winning me over. This is far from my favorite Metroid game, but it's a really enjoyable, great game that I will be returning to for years to come. Ever since the release of Corruption, the series has been in a bit of a hiatus. In the alternate ending of the game, achieved after finding every item, we can see a mysterious looking ship follow Samus through space, clearly trying to go unnoticed. This ship is said to belong to Silux from Metroid Prime Hunters, who hates both the Federation and Samus's guts. At E3 2015, series producer Kensuke Tanabe confirmed that this was the case, and he did express interest in creating an entire game out of the conflict between Samus and Silux. Despite Corruption closing out the trilogy, this left hope for a new continuation of Metroid Prime. The next mainline Metroid game to release was Metroid Other M in 2010, which was a disappointing evolution to many. I'll save my extended thoughts on this game for a future video, but the gist of it is that this game sucks. Many elements of the story flat out ignore events of prior games, and it interprets Samus as an entirely different character than what we've come to know her as. Somehow, the game received massive praise from critics and outlets, but the Metroid fandom despises this game regardless. After the release of Other M, it would be six years before Metroid fans heard news of a new game. Even though so much time had passed, the reception of the reveal of Metroid Prime Federation Force was lukewarm at best. Despite carrying its namesake, Federation Force bared very little resemblance to the Prime Trilogy. This game was a spin-off co-op multiplayer shooter made for the 3DS. This just wasn't the right game to bring Metroid back with. By 2016, very few people were interested in new games for the 3DS, since Nintendo's next home console was right around the corner. And let's be honest here, the 3DS is not the ideal console for a co-op multiplayer shooter. Upon release, the game sold very poorly due to these circumstances. Personally, I've never played it and I don't have any interest in doing so. At E3 2017, Nintendo dropped a bombshell that absolutely nobody had on their bingo cards. A simple teaser announcement explaining that Metroid Prime 4 was in development was more than enough to get people excited. Unfortunately, no further details about this title were shared until January of 2019, where Nintendo announced that the development of this game had been halted and cancelled, at least at whatever studio was working on it, presumably Bandai Namco. This announcement did come with some good news, however. Development of the game would be handed over to Retro Studios once again, with Kensuke Tanabe overseeing the project. Moreover, this move showed that Nintendo sincerely understands the magnitude of this game, and they want to make sure it lives up to the quality standards set by the trilogy. Although this meant development had to be restarted entirely, many fans still came out of this announcement with a positive outlook on the future. I for one am very happy with Nintendo's decision to send the project to Retro. As of right now though, this is all we know about the state of the game. Nearly four years after the announcement of the development restarting, we're still left speculating. Although, just knowing the game is in the pipeline has got me incredibly excited even after all this time. Metroid Prime 4 is my most anticipated unreleased game at the moment, and I will be playing it the second it comes out. Having said that, I'd like to discuss some of my hopes for the game to wrap up my discussion of the series. First and foremost, I want this game to combine aspects of every single one of the prior Prime games. I want it to feel like a true culmination of the series, much like Corruption was meant to be. I would like the game to show us more of the Metroid universe like the Federation and other planets. I really enjoyed that aspect of Corruption, and I'd love to see it expounded upon. I want to move on to a new threat facing the universe besides Phazon, as we wrap that up already. I want to explore the biggest worlds we've seen yet in the series, all with varied atmospheres and tons of possibilities for pathfinding and backtracking. I'd love to see the open world elements they originally envisioned for Corruption manifest here. I want a beautiful soundtrack to accompany these regions that will make them stick with me long after the credits roll. I want a large variety of beams to pick from, akin to the beams from Prime 1. 
but I'd also like to find objectively better upgrades that can add on to individual ones like in Corruption. This would promote both beam strategy and thorough exploration. I want some more occasional cutscenes that flesh Samus out as a character through unspoken actions. I want an art style that encompasses the spirit of the trilogy while still fully utilizing current or future gen hardware. I want to see all of the upgrades we've come to know and love throughout the series pushed to their absolute limits of creative uses. Maybe even the speed booster? My final hope is that the game is replayable. I want this game to continue to be fun after the first couple of playthroughs, and I want it to feel rewarding to do so. I have no doubt that Prime 4 will be a great game. It's really just a matter of what direction they decide to go with it. If it's just another entry in the Prime series, I'll be satisfied. Whenever we find out though, you can count on me to make a video on it. Maybe even multiple. This series just means so much to me that I want to share that love with others. It's exactly why I chose these games to make my first in-depth retrospectives on. The feedback I've gotten from you all has been overwhelmingly positive, and I can't thank you enough. Making these videos is really time consuming, but expressing myself in a way that other people find enjoyable makes it worthwhile in the end. I never thought I could learn so much just from writing about some of my favorite games. I hope someday I can find it in me to fully articulate how much this means to me, but I'm going to end it here for now. I hope you'll join me whenever I cover Metroid Prime 4, eventually. Thanks for watching.